it's amazing to be standing here in front of you and to have um, Dr. Eden and um, uh, my friend Karen Shearer at the same table with us. You know, um, the, the work that was done um, uh, by Karen Shearer and her colleague Francesca Adler Bader was really ground zero for some of the co-parenting work uh, with fragile families that I'm going to talk about today. And I just, I, I sat in complete awe of the encyclopedic knowledge that Dr. Eden has about families. I've learned so much from you, you know, more in your little finger than I know in my career. And um, I do know a few things about co-parenting. That's, I think, why they invited me here today. That's what we're going to be talking a little bit about. Um, and in particular, um, if there's a contribution I can make to this day, um, I hope that it's to um, maybe shift a little bit, or maybe a lot, the way that you all think about what co-parenting is. I'm going to use multiple times the metaphor of a triangle. Um, and if you leave here today and you carry out your work with the notion of a triangle in mind, as opposed to a two plus one, then I think you're going to do right by children and by families. And if you don't, then we'll continue to do a lot of what we've been doing for the last 50 years in trying to support families, which is fine and which is progressing and growing, but it's not, from my perspective, the right model. So that's a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Um, I will be talking a little bit about some intervention data, and I've come relatively late to this game. So I've come relatively late to working with uh, fragile families, but have uh, benefited from the opportunity to do some work over the last half decade or so uh, with African-American families in uh, South St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about Florida today or St. Petersburg today, but um, for those of you who have romantic notions about Florida and sunny beaches and, and cool winds and those kinds of things, there's certainly lots of lovely things there, and there are the same issues in um, cities in Florida as we see in cities anywhere in the United States. Uh, in uh, Pinellas County, which is one of the richest counties in uh, all of Florida, um, the, the county is uh, gentrified. Uh, about 80 to 85 percent of all African Americans live within a four zip code area in South St. Petersburg. Um, the schools serving the children who are growing up in those neighborhoods have been identified as some of the worst schools in the United States uh, in terms of the graduation rates. In a very rich county, um, in a very um, uh, sort of wonderful state, and um, the uh, the number of children, the proportion of children who are born to moms who are not married is 93% um, in the four zip code area that uh, I was telling you about in South St. Petersburg. And so um, we share some of the same challenges as Philadelphia, Detroit, Oakland, and many of the other cities where some of the um, amazing work that we've been hearing about is occurring right now. Um, and the families that I'm going to talk about today um, are families who were studied in projects supported by the Brady Education Foundation um, and now uh, in a just begun randomized control trial, which I won't have any data to talk about, but which a few years from now will give us a little bit more information on the effectiveness of some of the work that we're doing with these families. My main mission, as I said, is the first bullet um, on here to help make clear what it means when I use the term co-parenting. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about a model called focused co-parenting consultation. Um, and that term, I think, embodies a lot of uh, what we heard in the first presentation today about the child at the center. Um, focused co-parenting consultation is not a healthy marriage uh, intervention. It's not a responsible fatherhood intervention. It's an intervention about co-parenting. And uh, when I said that um, I'm honored to be here with Karen Scherer today, um, there together we can, which many of you know very well, was probably the, the very first intervention to really take seriously that it is possible to support co-parenting without going through the window or the, um, the portal of um, uh, healthy marriage, uh, healthy relationships, or responsible fatherhood. Those things are all together. They're all glommed together. But I do think that an intervention that focuses specifically on co-parenting, and our intervention is called figuring it out for the child, really speaks to the realities of the families that we're working with. I think that it, it um, honors the realities of the families that we work with. And I, I want to use that word honors as many times as I can today because that's really where we need to go if we're going to be more effective. And then finally, I want to show you in some of the videos that we have today a little bit about what happens when you work with families in a preventive way formatively to try to get folks talking together about their shared child before the child comes, regardless of what the obstacles may be. And there are many, and we heard about a lot of those in the presentation. Children from prior unions is just one. There are many, many obstacles that these families face. And without working um, specifically and exclusively with them on how are you going to figure these things out after the baby's here, we leave families to their own devices. But doing that sort of in a formative way um, changes a lot. 
Um, you have on the table in front of you, those who are here in the room, I know we're also streaming, um, but uh, Zero to Three was kind enough to allow us to reproduce this article, which appeared in the May issue, uh, Supporting Fathers and Mothers as Co-Parents, The Next Frontier for Infant Mental Health. Um, and in my field, most of the work that I do is in the infant family mental health field, working with children birth to age three. Um, and truly there, um, we um, uh, see every day what Dr. Reed was talking about toward the end of her presentation, that it's really a field about mothers and mothers and their infants. It's called infant mental health and it's infant uh, mental health in a dyadic context and the dyad is the dyad that they share with their moms. Um, and so um, everyone will say, yeah, when dad's around, we involve him and we love dads and, um, uh, and those things are true. Um, but that's very, very different than taking a triangular model with every family that you ever work with and making the assumption that this child, every child has two parents and will always have two parents. It's not slogan, it's not lip service, it's a, it's a conceptual model, it's a framework for doing work. And to the extent that some of you leave here today feeling like it's a worthwhile framework, I'll have done my job up here on the stage. Um, this is not my, I, I don't know that I've ever had a novel idea in my life. I've stand on a lot of people's shoulders and um, principally Patricia Mnuchin's shoulders. She wrote this in 1985, 30 years ago now, uh, trying to agitate developmental psychologists to stop thinking about mother-child relationships and thinking about the formative influence in children's lives and start appreciating and recognizing the child's reality, which is that after the infancy period, children view themselves as citizens of their family, whatever that family might look like. But their security in the world certainly is bolstered by the attachment they develop with their mom. Um, we are in Minnesota um, and everything that we know, uh, I, don't, I don't think Alan Srofe is here with us today, but boy, have, did I have a crush on Alan Srofe in graduate school. That man taught us more about children's development um, than anybody before or since. And um, we, we are so um, blessed to have learned what we learned from him. Um, of course, there was a flurry of activity on dads too, that hey, dads are just as good as moms and they get just as much formula in the kid's gut and they, the kids love their dads too. And this was the way developmental psychology was thinking about families for for forever, you know, it's a sort of mom, mom-child relationships and then, and then there's dads too and no one was thinking about family systems. And so um, that was um, my first contribution in, in 1995. This was along with a paper by Jay, Jay Belsky that same year. The first article that ever appeared in the child development literature that used the term co-parenting. We had not thought about children as growing up within the context of family systems within the child development literature. We had 50 years of family therapy research, right, that was talking about problematic families and clinical families and family systems. And uh, Sal Mnuchin had uh, taught us quite a bit about families uh, through his structural family theory. So we had all of the underpinnings that we needed to understand children's development as occurring within a family system and not just within parallel dyads the child's relationship with the mom, the child's relationship with dad, we actually had the opportunity from a lot of clinical work to think about the child's security and safety within the, the bosom of their family system. When I began uh, writing in 1995, um, I was as um, nucleo family centric as anyone could be. Um, the first decade of my work, which began in the mid-1980s, was really about nuclear family systems. And the first scholarship that um, I produced was about co-parenting in um, uh, heterosexual married uh, families raising children. Um, those were the um, families that most of us studied at that time. That was, those were the people whose um, uh, lives filled the pages of our journals when we did research studies on families and children's development. And um, it was a contribution, nevertheless, to describe co-parenting dynamics in those families because the one place where the word co-parenting did appear um, was in the burgeoning literature on um, post-divorce families. Because in the late 1970s, for the first time in our country's history, we started having lots and lots and lots of children growing up in divorced families. We didn't know much about them, and so the term co-parenting was coined. And so in 1995, we had um, a fair amount of knowledge about what co-parenting looked like in post-divorce family systems, and very little, if any, information about what co-parenting looked like in families that hadn't divorced. So there was some value in describing and writing about the triangular and family dynamics of children growing up in families um, where there were two parents raising them. Um, a lot of the thinking 
that um, um, guided my work was guided by Salvador Mnuchin's work. And then in um, 19, when was it? I want to say it was 1994, the Society for Research and Child Development, I met this amazing woman named Elizabeth Fivas um, at a conference. Um, and truly, um, things are teleological um, or they're not. But I went to the conference because the discussant was going to be Daniel Stern, and I wanted to go hear Daniel Stern and what he had to say. And Dan Daniel didn't make the conference. He didn't come to the conference, but Elizabeth Fivaz was there. So she had more time on stage than she had anticipated. And boy, did she um, wow me in terms of how she thought about the primary triangle, um, which is the mother-father-child triangle. Um, you know, I've said, I said it once before, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I'll say it again. Every child who's ever existed has two parents. And that's the primary triangle for Elizabeth Fivas. So it's not whether that triangle exists, it's what that triangle looks like. To let that sink in for a minute. It's not whether it exists, it's what it lo what's it look like. And then that leads to all kinds of new questions for the interventionist, if that's your model. Um, she was doing work in Lausanne, Switzerland that paralleled the work that I was doing in Berkeley, California. Uh, we didn't know of no one another's work until we met each other at that conference and we've been bosom buddies since then. We have written together, we've visited one another many, many times and um, remarkably found so many similar dynamics in North American middle class privileged families and Swiss middle-class privileged families in terms of the dynamics of family systems raising young children. Um, after the initial work on trying to understand what co-parenting looks like in nuclear family systems, um, then I became interested in the rest of the children in the world um, who are not growing up in nuclear family systems. And uh, the work on co-parenting in nuclear families has been handled ably by um, other terrific researchers around the United States and, and the world um, since probably around 2002. Um, and since that time, I've been really working to study um, co-parenting in diverse family systems. And when I say um, diverse family systems, I mean every family system in the world. I don't just mean certain, you know, sort of boutique kinds of families. I mean, I mean every family. We have the, um, the um, mission at the Family Studies Center at USF St. Petersburg to really shed light on co-parenting in all family systems, and with the idea being that every child is co-parented. I said that in uh, Leipzig, Germany several years ago at a, a Congress for the World Association for Infant Mental Health and had several people who came up to the stage afterward and said, this is all American propaganda. Every child is not co-parented. We have mothers here who are intentionally having children by artificial insemination. They don't want the child to know who the father is. They will not have anybody involved in the child's life. They will just raise the child themselves. There is no co-parenting there. So, okay, I, I give you that. Is, is there an opportunity for anyone else to provide some socialization for the child? Is it possible that there may be others in the family who are involved who will be spending time with the child? Will the child be in out-of-home child care as an infant? Will there be others shaping the child? And are the individuals who are involved going to be working together with the mom or not working together with the mom? And so sort of puzzled and shook their head and said, well, maybe. You know, maybe there will be somebody besides just the mom and the child's life at some point between birth and age 18. So maybe there might be some co-parenting that goes on. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm saying this not to be disparaging. I'm saying this because I think that if we broaden the notion of co-parenting to think about who are the important individuals in the life of the child who will or will not be working together but will nevertheless be shaping and having developmental influence in that child's life, then we have a completely different question that we're asking. My colleagues in Southeast Asia will tell me that we do not have a whole lot of diaper changing and feeding going on by Vietnamese dads with their infants. Um, and then when the question becomes, and do Vietnamese fathers have developmental influence in shaping their children's lives, the answer becomes, of course they do. And so that they are co-parents in a very, very real sense, um, although they're not doing any division of labor kinds of things, which was our definition of co-parenting back in 1995. So what I'm trying to do here is to set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about. What I'm going to be talking about today is, are the ways that mothers and fathers share co-parenting in fragile families and the opportunities for promoting stronger co-parenting um, by working together to figure things out for the child. This was a Dewey wins the presidency um, kind of thing here. On the left, the American Psychological Association published our book on co-parenting in diverse family systems back in 2011. And when they sent me the, um, the proofs for the cover, they sent me the uh, cover on the left. And I said, nope, that's not right. Co-parenting does not have a hyphen. 
I said, yes, it does. I said, no, it doesn't. 72 emails back and forth. I refused to have them publish the book until they took the hyphen out of co-parenting, which they finally did. 72 emails. I kept all of them. So this is, the, this is the book that was finally published, the one on the right. And the point of this is we're not co-parenting, we're co-parenting. For the child, this is what we're doing. And so um, it's, it's really hilarious. I mean, if you want to you go up, you know, sort of take a look, half the articles published have a hyphen, half don't. People are using co-parenting without a hyphen. I think that that's a good thing in terms of the symbolic significance of co-parenting without a hyphen because we don't want people co-parenting at a distance. We want them co-parenting together so long as um, there's safety. And I will say that a couple of times today. But often people's minds go immediately to situations in which a co-parent is not safe and wonder about whether or not we ought to be trying to encourage co-parenting in those situations. And there certainly are situations where um, there is um, or there are safety issues when it's not wise to put a mother and father together or uh, two women together, two men together um, in co-parenting. That's a, a very, very small minority. And when your mind goes immediately to the exception rather than the rule, that is the thing that allows you to kind of keep status quo in place. And so I, I, I need people to be thinking about that. We need to be doing some very careful triaging at the beginning when we work with families to assess safety issues and then presuming that this is a family that we can work with, we go. I'm going to say a little bit more about that later when I talk about our current randomized control trial. This is my definition of co-parenting. Co-parenting refers to the mutual joint efforts of adults raising children for whom they share responsibility. Period. Done. That's what co-parenting is. You have lots of articles defining co-parenting, operationalizing co-parenting, measuring co-parenting. I can't tell you how many emails I get a year. Do you have a great three-item measure of co-parenting that I can use in my new study? I'm like, no. There is no good three-item measure of co-parenting. You need to understand the family and the family system to really understand how the family works together to co-parent. Um, I use this slide um, only because the picture in the middle is a slide from one of my most recent doctoral students um, from Turkey who studied um, um, co-parenting in mother-grandmother dyads in Turkey. Um, and what's very interesting about mother-grandmother dyads in Turkey is that the involved grandmothers are typically the father's mother and not the mother's mother. And so um, we have yet another family system that we need to understand and think about from a co-parenting framework if one has the definition of co-parenting as being the mutual joint efforts of those who share responsibility for co-parenting. So this is our um, flyer at the Family Study Center at USF St. Petersburg. Um, we can. I'm delighted to field questions about this later. We have projects underway and have completed projects on incarcerated mothers where the maternal grandmother is caring for the child during the mom's time away. We have done studies with high conflict post-divorce families who have flunked out of parenting coordination. We are currently involved in a big initiative with biological and foster parents to try to promote biological foster parent co-parenting from the time of removal towards successful reunification. There's not a family system that you can name to me where we can't do a better job of supporting co-parenting within that family system. If the family system is working well, if co-parenting is going well, the adults who are doing the co-parenting are providing support and solidarity for one another. They are finding ways to be consistent and predictable in the approaches that they take. And this is especially important with children birth to age three. This does not mean that mothers and fathers have to behave in the same way because they don't. You know they don't. And kids love the fact that they don't. But to the extent that um, there is consistency and predictability in routines, in responding to crying, and doing all of these things with very, very young children, you're going to create a greater likelihood that there's going to be regulation that begins to develop in that child as opposed to being dysregulation when there's all kinds of different things being done. This is one of the top reasons that mothers give us for why they do not feel comfortable with their children spending lots of times at dad's house with dad's people because they're not quite sure what's going to happen over there and they're concerned that the baby continue to have the routines. Not that they're opposed to doing that philosophically, not that they're gatekeeping, but that they're concerned whether or not the dads are going to be able to provide the same kind of um, uh, routines really for the baby as the moms are providing. And I've got some good examples of that in just a little bit on some of the video that we'll see. Security and integrity of the family's home base, regardless of whether that's a single domicile or multiple. 
Family level security. This was Patricia Mnuchin's idea. This concept has been developed since then. This is children's reality post-infancy. Is my family going to break apart or is my family kind of together as a unit? And it doesn't matter if it's one house or lots of houses. That's what helps the child feel secure in the world is a sense of family level security and that can be provided for fit kids whether or not there's one or multiple domiciles. And the last one, accurate empathy and attunement to the child's needs. This is a big one too. Um, in every family that's ever existed, Existed. parents have had somewhat different ideas about how their kids should be raised. That's not pathology, that's just human nature and reality. Um, but in, in the families where things go pretty well, the moms and dads or the moms and moms or the moms and grandmoms or whoever the co-parents are end up getting on the same page. And in some families they don't. And the families where the, the concerns are the greatest are the families where the adults see the children differently. They have different perspectives on who this kid is. And so accurate empathy and attunement to the child's needs is very, very important for successful co-parenting to, to be carried out. I've said to you before that co-parenting is a triangular construct. And so the work I'm going to talk about um, in just a couple of minutes is work that we carried out where we started with a triangular concept from the very beginning. And we've now been able to get some of the first publications out on the results of that work. But from the very beginning, we knew that we were going to be studying uh, mothers and fathers and infants together in uh, triangular situations after the baby was born. This is um, the first uh, project, to my knowledge, in the history of the world that is tried to do this because most folks don't see mothers and fathers and babies in African-American fragile families where the fathers are not co-residential as triangles. And so people don't even bother to look to see what's happening there because that's not the model for what the family is. But if you take a look there, you find some very interesting things. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of those things in just a couple of minutes. One of the challenges in handing off the co-parenting field to my friends and colleagues around the world has been that people sort of kind of tweak the definition a little bit to fit their own um, views of things, which is fine. Everybody can define things however they want. But I think it becomes problematic when um, people look at the triangle not as a triangle, but as a two plus one. And um, the, uh, Dr. Eden was talking about the legitimate power that mothers have in families. And so what I have witnessed over the last decade is this growth and proliferation of the term gatekeeping. And um, who are gatekeepers in mother, father, child families? Well, they're the moms. So what that does is it describes a tremendous amount of power to mothers to dictate the family dynamic. And true, not true, that's not my point. My point is that it's sort of describing the family dynamic as lying within the hands of one person rather than seeing the family system as something that's co-constructed by three people. And not two people, but by three people. By three people. A triangle is a triangle. There's three legs to a triangle. Um, this is um, one of the sets of findings that the, the way that the family went rested in the mother's hands. And so this is putting, you know, we had mother blaming for so many years. And then, of course, as Dr. Eden talked about, we had father blaming. Um, and that went on for a while. But, you know, a, a family, a, a triangle, a family triangle is something, it's a dynamic that is co-constructed by all of the members of that triangle. There's not one person who's the author of that. Um, some of the original studies that we did, we were really astonished to find um, different responses to mothers telling fathers what to do. In some families, when mothers told fathers what to do, they would spit right back, and then there's this battle would ensue. And in other families where mothers told fathers to do, fathers said, okay, and they did what the mother said. And that exact same behavior by the mother led to two very, very different family dynamics depending upon the father's contribution to the dynamic at that point. It's co-constructed by multiple people. And I made the mistake in the first 10 years of my work at looking at the two adults and not looking at the baby. And we're going to take a look at the baby in a little while as well because the baby is a member of this triangle. Um, when I learned a little bit about this field. As I was learning a bit about this field, um, Linda Burton was my uh, sensei and muse. In fact, Linda was uh, the first person that turned me on to your work. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm very, very grateful that she did. And um, this is, I think, what we're doing here today, or at least part of what we're doing here today. We're truly trying to understand healthy, strong, positive family processes within the context of what families do already. This is what Mnuchin taught us. This is what Patricia Mnuchin taught us in her book, Working with Families of the Poor, that families do create functional structures and systems, and we go in and we mess them up. That's what we do, because we don't understand family systems. And so the notion that African-American mothers gatekeep and want to keep fathers away from their children. We're not, we're not seeing that any more than Rebecca saw fathers who wanted to abdicate the responsibility for their kids. 
It's not that we're not seeing it all, but to, to describe that as the driving dynamic of the family system that helps to explain why these negative outcomes are occurring, I think is really doing an injustice to mothers and to families. This was the most important article that I read um, when I was beginning to learn about um, African-American families, the notion that um, African-American families have always been uh, systems in which the care and support for children are provided by multiple others, and so that child's family system runs broad and deep, and it can span multiple households. When the child moves from the mother's home to stay with grandma, the child is not being ripped away from the family as we would describe them in a nuclear middle-class family and sent away, but they're going back home again. And really thinking about the notion that many people can provide support for a child as being endemic to African-American family system and structure, and the notion that there's something that you're post-divorce European American families can learn about this, where children are cut off not just from one parent, but from the parent's entire family, all the aunts and uncles and cousins and everything after a high contentious divorce, um, was really a way of my thinking differently about families. And I'm still learning every day. I make mistakes every day. Um, but you need to listen and learn to the families that you work with, and then you are able to um, take some steps in the right direction. This is a relatively recent piece of work. I think this is a 2015. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see. But it's relatively, um, gatekeeping consists of maternal behaviors with the potential to facilitate as well as limit father behavior. Well, that's, that's not not true. But that's not what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about is co-parenting as a system that's co-constructed by mothers and fathers together from the beginning. Negative forms of gatekeeping do exist, and they exist in African-American fragile families. We know a lot about these families now from some of the research that um, Dr. Eden talked about with the Fragile Families Child Wellbeing Study. We know about the psychologies of many of these families. We know about their life circumstances. But we really, truly did not have a co-parenting intervention developed that would work with some of these issues for the families. Now, the Together We Can intervention, I think, is a great example of what's possible um, in working with these families. Um, what we sought to do was to develop an intervention um, that reduce the focus on responsible fatherhood. Um, I, I know that I've got um, an audience here um, representing many different fields, and so um, when I do this presentation for folks who are in um, the judicial system and say that we didn't talk at all about co-parent, I'm sorry, um, child support in our intervention, people like sort of look, look alarmed, and, and we don't talk about child support. That's not the way that we think about fathers in our project. We will talk about child support if it is raised by the family as an issue and it comes up, we will do that. But if the family doesn't raise that, we work with whatever the issues are that the family brings to us. Um, we are also not, uh, we're coming at things from a healthy marriage initiative. I think I was really um, taken by some of the um, information that um, uh, uh, Dr. Eden pr uh, presented about um, the child being the center and that the relationship kind of comes later. And that's certainly what we were seeing as well, that the child is really the focus in the beginning. It's not that the relationship is not important and we certainly don't want screaming and yelling and conflict in a relationship because that's bad for babies. Um, but that's a different thing than me focusing on commitment and long-term relationships, which maybe can come later, but it's not the first thing through the, through the door when we work with the families we work with. Instead, we used um, a uh, intervention that I developed some time ago that we've used with diverse families. We've used with married nuclear families. We've used with um, mother, grandmother, uh, intergenerational family systems with youth post-divorce families. In this case, we developed the intervention for unmarried families expecting a first child. Focus co-parenting consultation has three stages, so it's not psychoeducation in the way that we typically would think about educational interventions. We're not telling parents what to do. It's relatively experiential in the beginning stages. We're really trying to heighten consciousness about the importance of um, uh, father involvement and, um, and co-parenting um, of the child. Um, the consciousness raising stage, if we had more time, I would walk you through some of what we do. Um, but this is very, very important that both parents appreciate and understand why it is that they're there. And in fact, the focus co-parenting consultation is just about co-parenting. Um, when you're working with families and they want to go out here and be talking about something else, you bring them back to co-parenting. That's the contract with them. That's why they're there to work with you. It's about the child. Um, the um, videos that we use will differ depending upon uh, the population we're working with. When working with divorced families, we have a video of a high conflict divorce and the child um, being, there's a video called Tears that was made by a Swedish filmmaker about the child watching the, the family start to fight with each other, trying to repair it, being unsuccessful, and then falling down an abyss. That's a very powerful image for parents as they see what happens to this child who's trying to make things right and then ultimately is lost because of the conflict. With the families that we work with, the video is on children 
children, talking about what it would have meant to them to have had fathers. Um, and then the couple, the mother and father, talk about the video together and their reactions to the video, intended to speak at two different levels. One is they have a child on the way, and their child doesn't have to be saying what these children were saying. And the second being that the children often speak for the parents who themselves may have come up without parents and, and without fathers and never have articulated that. And so there's a connection, a heart connection that gets made in that way as well. You don't just hand someone the statistics that show the negative outcomes for kids who grow up without fatherless children, without fathers, because so many of the parents came up without fathers and they're standing there and they're doing fine. So those statistics mean nothing to them. And so instead, what you have them do is talk about folks they know in their community who did and didn't come up with dads and how are they doing right now. And so it becomes a little bit more real as it's sort of in front of them. And this experiential way of raising consciousness is truly important to do before you move to the later stages, which is the skill building, teaching some of the skills that are, there's nothing magical about them than the same kind of things that you and I would have if we went with our partners into couples therapy. You know, there's their technical reflective listening and I statements and things like that. You do that after the consciousness has been raised, after the will has been built to do this together. I can't emphasize strongly enough that that part is really important, that they're both there together for the common purpose to be working with the child, whether or not they're in a relationship with one another, most or not, about half of our families not living together. So our families were far less likely than families in the fragile family study to say that they imagined that at some point they would get married. About 40 some percent of our families imagined that that might be in the cards for them in the future as opposed to something like 80 percent in the fragile family study. But nevertheless, they came, they stayed, um, we did the skill building, and the last stage after the consciousness raising and skill building are enactments. So once they know why they're there, once the motivation has been raised, they're in this for the child, they've developed the skills, you say, okay, do it. What's, what's getting in the way? What are the issues for you now? Grandmom doesn't want dad coming around, and they've got to figure out how they're going to take care of that. There are kids from a prior relationship. She doesn't want the baby going over to dad's house because his little brother smokes pot, and it's not going to be safe for the baby. Whatever the issues are for that couple, and I'm calling them a couple because in this sense they are a mom and a dad working together for their baby, that's what you work on in the enactments. And the folks who are working with them as interventionists stay back and let them do the work. Okay, they'll step in if it's needed, but they'll stay back if it's not. So they're really doing this work in the enactment phase. At the end, enactment is a Mnuchin term, you know, when you actually have the folks to sort of um, go through whatever the issues are for them. And then at the very end, um, we have them create a shared plan, not an individual family support plan, not anything with legal binding, not anything that goes into a case file, but their plan for their child. They do them first individually, and then they put it together, and they co-construct a plan together that they both agree on for their child at the end of the intervention. Um, we um, have done this work now with about, uh, I'd say about 40 families, intensive work with about 40 families. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about that work and what the um, uh, and data looks like from that work. Um, this is the intervention, figuring it out for the child. Um, this was work that was sponsored by the Brady Education Foundation. Um, very interesting in terms of the kinds of um, projects that are uh, alluring to federal funders. We initially went to the National Institutes of Health with this idea and um, got some decent reviews, except we had one reviewer who was very stodgy and said, this is insanity. Nobody's going to come to this. We're going to be throwing money down a hole. Nobody's going to want to come to your dyadic intervention when they're not together in a relationship. They're not going to sit together for that. And so we said, okay, and we took the grant. We sent it off to Brady Education Foundation, who funded immediately. Brady Education Foundation's mission is closing the black-white achievement gap. This is the first project that they ever funded where the child had not actually been born yet, but they were trying to close the achievement gap for the child because they saw the wisdom of trying to seed the positive family environment for that child. And um, th we came back to NIH, by the way, with our Brady um, data, and they said, this is great, we'll fund this for you. So we have a randomized control trial now, but the pilot data was necessary. The idea itself was a little bit out there for, for funders in the beginning. So with the Figuring It Out for the Child project, it was a six-session prenatal intervention. Um, it was designed together with our African-American community. We sketched out the beginnings of it um, at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, and then we brought it to elders in the community who have been working with these young folks for um, a generation and said, have at it, and they did. And many things were taken out, many things were added, um, but in the end, 
we came up with an intervention that was successfully delivered by paraprofessionals. I think that's important to tell you that the figuring out the child intervention was delivered by um, people who were home visitors, they were fatherhood education uh, personnel, they were health educators, they were not licensed social workers, they were folks who learned how to do the intervention already on the front lines working with these families were able to deliver the intervention with good fidelity. Um, I'm going to move relatively quickly because we're short on time and I want to get to some of the outcomes. But uh, this is published work. You can go through and read a little bit about what we did with families. I've described to you a little bit the, um, the model, the three-phase model, consciousness raising, skill building, and enactment. Um, the families that we saw ranged in age from 14 to 53. 53-year-old uh, dad had been around the block a few times and he was going to get this child right. He came, he stayed. Um, to kind of jump a little bit to the end, 100% of the families who came and attended a session one completed the intervention. 100% of the families were co-parenting at three months postpartum in the sense that both had regular contact with their child. This was not an intervention that sent families screaming into the night. They came, they stayed, they benefited from this. Where I think I want to close here, because I know I'm a couple minutes over, is with this sequence here. Um, this is what's, I think, so very important about this work. If you see the family as a triangle, as a unit, um, then you have the opportunity to see what actually happens when you bring the unit together. Specifically, we're looking at families after a co-parent intervention. Here is a baby doing what we call um, showing um, uh, triadic competence, playing together with the mom, then going over, reorienting toward the dad, playing with dad, then goes back to mom again. Babies come into the world prepared for social interaction. At 100 days postpartum, infants show the capacity for this triangular connection between two people. I was taught in graduate school that they were still looking at the contours of faces at three months. Nonsense. Babies are capable of tracking interactions between adults at three months postpartum. They're noticing what's going on between mom and dad. And not only are they noticing, hey mom, look what dad and I are doing over here, back to dad again, but they're actually drawing fathers in. The baby reaches for the father's face, touches father's face, the father comes toward the baby. This is what's important about this work, that what we're trying to do is to create a family alliance that endures through time. We're trying to do that by seeding that alliance before the baby comes. The co-parenting is going to look like whatever it looks like in that family system. And we're not assessing it. I showed this presentation in Miami circuit court judges and after we, we talked about the findings and how involved the fathers were and how sensitive and responsive they were to their babies and how they responded 77 percent of the time to infant signals by showing proper attunement um, one of the judges raised the hand and said um, how much child support did you collect and i said i said i, I don't know we didn't assess that and one of the judges says well what good is it then this is what good it is this is what good it is that the, the concluding slide that I have for you, and I'll have to jump through 100 to get there. I apologize, but I'm going to do that. Here we go, through all these slides here. I was going to teach you all this stuff. So, um, yeah, here we go. Fathers are going to bond with their babies if they know their babies. They will know their babies if they are around their babies. They will be around their babies if they and their baby's mothers collaboratively figure it out for their child. Child is father to the man. We know from Dr. Eden's presentation that these dads can't wait for the babies to get there. They are delighted, they are happy, they are ready to be fathers, and everything that we do prevents them from being fathers. Everything we do prevents them from being fathers. If we can enable the families, help the families internally, inside the family system to figure out how this is going to work, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen perfectly in 100% of the cases all the time, but you're going to enable the possibility for a co-parenting alliance to develop. And every study that I've done since 1995 has shown that that's going to benefit the child. When co-parenting alliances are strong, children thrive. When co-parenting alliances are damaged, either conflictual or disengaged, children struggle. If we're looking at this through the eyes of the child, this is what we need to be doing. That's it.